Bob James. Good evening. Welcome to the Dusty Groove. Hi, Mike. It's very nice to be talking to you. It's uh, fantastic to speak to you. So, um, 2015, a busy year. It certainly has turned out to be that. I, I, I imagined a year ago that I would be thinking about slowing down, but a lot of good opportunities have come up, and we've got a 25th anniversary. Um, also, my pal Nathan East in Fort Play, he and I have done a duo album, which we've been working on all during the first part of this year, and actually we just finished mixing it, so it'll be coming out later in the year. And then I have this live CD that has just come out, which uh, is a concert that I played uh, last year in May uh, here in my uh, city where I live, Traverse City, Michigan. I've been in the fortunate position where I've where I've had the CD now for a couple of weeks. It, it amazes me, you know, with a back catalogue like you've got, how how on earth do you pick, you know, six seven tracks to play live? I mean, I mean, fantastic tracks, you know, Westchester Lady, Angela, Nautilus, uh, Nightcrawler. I mean, it's just fantastic. But well, you, thank you so much. But how, how on earth do you pick? How do you pick them? Well, uh, the certainly uh, my fans help me out a lot with that because uh, we're we're interacting with them a lot more these days. We go out and sign autographs after the show and sometimes have a chance to chat. And yeah. I'm always getting people up. Why don't you play that? And uh, it seems like I'm lucky enough to have some fans that have been very loyal, and and I very often end up needing to play songs in the 1970s, such as Westchester Lady. And, so uh, I try to change up my repertoire a lot, and this particular concert, it just happened that this was the one we chose, and we didn't actually even know that it was being recorded until after the concert. It was one of those situations. I was actually thinking on stage that I wish it was being recorded. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when the uh, promoter, Gene Gentleman, who's the curator of the uh, museum that is is located in that same building mm -hmm. when he told me that his engineer had had recorded it just for what he thought was going to be archival purposes uh i i was very happy and and then of course when i investigated the tracks and listened back later on um i, I felt it was strong enough to uh, go ahead and produce it live for a live cd yeah i mean that's, it is a fantastic and i, I all our, our listeners out there right heartily recommend that you um that you go out and and you purchase this cd it's just it's fantastic that the old classics are on there um i think we'll we'll we'll, we'll take a listen to uh, to one of the classics we'll take a listen to uh, nightcrawler
With a back catalogue like yourself, what track are you most proud of? Do you actually sit there and say, "I, I wrote that"? You know, this is this is fantastic. I, 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 from this CD or from the, from, from any the, from the any CD. We're now to I, have I, to pick one. Yeah, lucky I'm, to have a lot of them. I know. I mean, I've now sort of looked, and um, in my collection alone, I, I'm up to fifty-five solo albums of yours. 
and 13 four play albums so there's there's a heck of a lot to um you know to choose from but are there any particular tracks that you are you are proud of you know over and above any any of the others say that mike i for one thing, uh, I will admit that I don't go back and listen to my own stuff. Really? Because I, I like to move forward and think about the future. And in many ways, I once I get done with the record, in the early stages after I've done it, I've, I've been listening to it so much that I definitely like getting away from it and moving on, <laughs> listening to other things. Sometimes, much, much later, sometimes I even have my music collection that's in iTunes. I have it on shuffle mode. And I'll even stumble onto a track of mine that I didn't even realize I was going to play, and and that can either be a shocking experience or, or sometimes it's a fun experience. <laughs> Are there any tracks that that you can actually pinpoint that that led to a step change in your career or in your life? Are there... Certainly, of course, I could could do that, but the, certainly the, uh, the the song "Restoration" uh, stands out for me in that way. I yeah. I think it's one of the, my favorites of the compositions that I've written, and it so happened that that's the one that we were recording on the day that we had the conversation about starting the group four play, yeah. and uh, well, I, it it that remains in my memory as a really really very special time.
know you're very big into your sort of classical music as well but are there are there particular artists in the smooth jazz uh, or the contemporary jazz genre that you you're listening to well to tell you the truth right i've just been finishing this duo album with uh Nathan East, he and I have made, and so I've been doing a tremendous amount of listening to that. And uh, in order to avoid too much ear fatigue, <laughs> I usually rest after that. So I haven't, I haven't listened as much as I would like, and as much as I might under other circumstances. I had um, the opportunity to guest on a CD by Tom Braxton, the great uh, smooth jazz saxophonist. Yeah, we know. We and know. I played on one of the tunes from his new record. And I definitely listened to that. It's called The Next Chapter. He's a wonderful musician. Uh, Lee Ritt, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Earl Clue uh, also guested on it, and Peter White. And the song that I played on was called Nuevo. So here it is, Nuevo by Tom Braxton.
Bob, if there if there was such a thing, you know, you've been around the music industry for you know quite a few years now. I won't say how many years, and uh, I'm sure you'll tell me off if I did. But if there was such a thing as a time machine, and you could go back and visit a young Bob, what advice would you give yourself? Well, I definitely would practice more, uh, and in terms of my profession, I was not what I would call a, a good practicer, and and I didn't even really understand as, as much as I should have the value of it because when I go back now and it's, it seems much more difficult at an old age to acquire technique that that you didn't have before and I wish so this basic preparation or the basic skills best time to do that as a younger the better and in, in my case I definitely wish that I would have I also have good reason to wish that I had pursued a little bit more my my interest in classical composition because this year I've undertaken to compose a piano concerto and I'm lucky enough that it's going to get performed this coming September in Tokyo with the Tokyo Philharmonic and I'm rather desperately scrambling to finish it. Uh, it has required a lot more work than I thought it would. And uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying the process of doing it, but, but realizing that I didn't take advantage of my classical training uh, as much as I probably should have by writing more music in this genre. I, I have done a lot of jazz composition, but to be a jazz composer, part of what you try to do is stay out of the way of musicians. You you give them a skeletal, basic theme, perhaps bass line, a few arranging things, but you don't want to overwrite and inhibit your players. Yeah. In, the, in the classical world, it's kind of the opposite. You, you articulate everything, and the more you articulate it, the better your chances are of getting an accurate performance of what you have in your head. Yeah. Three tra- if there were three tracks of of Bob of Bob James that you could that you could choose that said this sums up who I am, what would those three tracks be? Wow, that's a tough one. <laughs> uh, I'd have to choose Westchester Lady. That's become my kind of signature piece for sure that everybody asked me about. Yep. And we could choose the live version from the live at Millican CD. I- uh, I have several versions of it. Uh, I had also played it on my live record all around the town many, many years ago. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, of course, the original version was on my album three. Yeah. Um, so that'd be one. Um, let me think. And I, be- I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, be- uh, did you not write the, the killer bass line for that as well? It, oh, yes, it, absolutely. It, it wasn't a... Um, it was Will Lee that, that that actually that actually played on that um, that session, was it not? Right. And, and yes, it was. At that time, I was using Gary King most of the time on bass, but he was sick. He was sick. during the, those sessions, and and uh, I used Will Lee, and he, Will and I have remained friends. And he tells me very often that uh, if I had used him more often, I would have had more hits. <laughs> that he, he he doesn't mind taking a little bit of credit for. <laughs> But, but yes, I did write the bass line, and that was was sort of a style, a way of writing during that era because the jazz had shifted away from the upright bass more to the electric bass, and the melodic lines were more prominent than they had been back in the bebop era where the role of the bass was more rhythmic and, and the, the compositions would not necessarily it had those kinds of uh, hook uh, bass riffs but I was doing that a lot in those days and uh, if, if you had a memorable melody and a, a bass line riff you were kind of done uh, because the rest of it was all improvised yeah if I have to pick two more two what more they be I think I would probably pick my song put our hearts together because it has a very emotional Meaning for me, uh, the recorded version, well, I have a couple of recorded versions that are available. My instrumental solo version of it on my song, uh, on my album alone. But the uh, the vocal version of the song, which is on four plays, um, Such a Sky, 
Uh, there are actually two versions of it on there. There's an instrumental version and a vocal version by Seiko Matsuda, uh, a very famous pop Japanese singer. And the lyrics for that song were composed by my daughter Hillary, mm -hmm. which is another reason why it has very special significance for me. But it's one of the few times when I've actually specifically tried to compose something to help raise the spirits or to have it send out a specific message. Yeah. Uh, in instrumental music, uh, usually we're dealing in the abstract. And we, of course, we want to move people and have them feel the music emotionally, but it's, but it isn't so much, uh, most of the time it isn't a specific emotion. In this case, I was headed over to Japan to try to help, um, make a contribution toward raising their spirits after the, the terrible tsunami, tsunami. that happened in March 2011. And I composed this song on that occasion. Uh, I definitely feel that's a very pivotal, important song in my career. Yeah. Uh, so one more. Of course, it might be probably the most obvious one would be the theme from Taxi, the TV series uh, Angela. That's also the other song that I get requested the most. Yep. Um, and maybe we should just let it go at that. And, and, Okay. Perhaps rather than that, maybe it's a little bit less well-known in certain circles, the song Nautilus that was on my first CTI album, yep. One, uh, has become quite a, a mainstay in the hip-hop uh, world and has been sampled many hundreds of times on other hip-hop recordings and it took on a new life in the hip-hop era that I never in a million years would have anticipated. I believe it's... I, I believe it's uh, one of the, the top 10 most sampled records of all time, I believe. Yes, and so it, it, it was just an amazing experience because when I first did it back in the 1974, no one paid attention to that cut at all. In fact, it was in the LP era and we tended to put the, the weakest or the songs that we thought would would get the least attention on side B uh, and this song, Nautilus, was actually the last cut on side B on that album. So it took uh, some very creative people from the hip-hop industry to even find it. <laughs> and, and after they did, once again, I think it really had to do with the bass line, maybe more than anything else. And the, of course, the unique groove that my rhythm section guys got on it. Idris Muhammad was on drums. And, Gary King again was on bass, and uh, Bob McDonald was on percussion. Eric Gale on guitar, and and uh, I wouldn't mind having that that recording of mine uh, be represented certainly in the top group of, of of my records. So we'll leave it there, and we'll go out with the live version from the uh, from Bob's new okay, live album. Um, this is Nautilus. Bob, thanks for being part of the uh, Love Music Radio family. And well, and I'm glad we were able to get to the finish line. It's <laughs> like we were going to have a little slight, fun today, but we, we hung in there. Slight technical difficulties uh, and reverted to um, the cell phones, hence, hence the um, beeping in the background slightly. But um, I appreciate it very much. Thank you for playing my music and... I wish you lots and lots of success with the show. Thanks ever so much. And we will, um, when you're in the UK, maybe you can come down to sunny Sussex and we'll do, uh, we'll do an interview in person. I'd be delighted to. <laughs> Thank you.
Huge thank you to Bob Jones for uh, sparing us the time to come and have a quick chat with us uh, this evening. His CD, Live at the Millican Auditorium, is out now. And two, uh, two more CDs available from Bob this year. Alone and a duet CD with Nathan East. And also... Foreplay have their 25th anniversary CD later on in the year. So that is just about it for this evening. Once again, a huge, huge thank you to Bob James for uh, being with us this evening. All the way live from Traverse City in Michigan. So this will be the last track for this evening. And this one takes us out, and this is Woman of Ireland. Thanks ever so much for listening, and I will catch you later on in the week with the rest of the gang. 
Till then, I'll leave you with Bob and the woman of Ireland. <laughs>